Good to see you this morning. Glad you're here. Thank you to all our campuses. Uh, glad you're a part of this. We're in a message series called This Is Us. It's a parenting series, and we're laying it out there. By the way, I'm not an expert. Just because I had kids doesn't make me an expert. Uh, you, the only experts I know in parenting have not had children. And so everybody, if you never had a kid, you're an expert, right? Like, I'll never do that. I'll never do that. I'll never. This is how you should do it. And by the way, uh, people write books like that. That's fine and, and all. But uh, it's just crazy, right? And, and so this is tough. It's very hard. And what we're talking about today is probably the, uh, the hardest part of being a mom or a dad. And we're going to talk about discipline. And probably like every kid's like, ah, no, not this one. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk about it. And um, each child is different. And one kid com could be completely compliant. The other massively defiant. Um, one likes, uh, you know, it's like, like grounding. Like you try to ground a kid. Have you ever grounded a kid and then they skip to their room? Like, this is going to be fun. Yeah, thank you for putting me away from my brother. This is great. I love being sequestered here. Sure. Uh, you don't want to be too hard. You don't want to be too lenient. That was the, uh, a lot of response that I got back from Facebook uh, posting was, I don't know if I'm too, you know, it's like, am I being too hard on the kid or too lenient? Now, every kid will say that you're too hard on them, right? But uh, we're not asking them. We're not asking them. This is, this is, uh, I don't know if this is a revelation to you today, but you're the parent. So I'm going to give you permission to do that. Um, Probably, uh, and again, if you're married, and you, uh, you're coming at it uh, from your background, right? So your mom and dad parented you this way, and, and maybe it was massive, like, drill sergeant stuff. And the other side is like, hey, you know, uh, we grew up in the 60s, so everything's cool. Um, and so, you know, you try to mash that together, and it's very hard to, to kind of do that. And, and typically, again, you got one parent who's, who's uh, the, the mean parent and the one that's super fun parent, and that's not fair either. So we'll talk about that. But probably you've made this statement. I will never do that to my kids, right? I will never spank my kids. Oops. Right? I will never yell at my kids. Oops. I will never quote scripture. That's for the Christians here. Right? You ever quote scripture to your kids? It, it's not effective. Now, why is discipline important? We should take a look at this. Proverbs 3, 11 through 18, written by the smartest guy on the planet. So Solomon's writing this. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. So this is towards us. It's not towards kids. This is towards us, those who follow God, right? And, and uh, don't reject the Lord's discipline. And don't be upset when he corrects you. I don't want to see, and basically he says, I don't want to see you in Walmart laying on the ground. Like when your parents correct you, like, eh, you know, it's like, don't do that with God either. How many of us have said that to God? <laughs> this is not fair. Why are you doing this? You're ridiculous. Who do you think you are? Oh, yeah. Don't ever say that to God. By the way. For the Lord, check this out, corrects those he loves. Just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. So the purpose of discipline is always wisdom. For wisdom is more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more important than gold and silver. Fairly appropriate today on Berkshire Hathaway weekend. <laughs> By the way, we, um, if you're here today for the first time because you're here part of the Berkshire Hathaway stuff, uh, we will be receiving a second offering <laughs> just for you. Yeah. It's a new policy. I know we always say, hey, if you're visiting here, don't do it. Yeah, yesterday, I was uh, having lunch at Stella's in Bellevue, which is mind-blowing, by the way. If you've never been there, if you love hamburgers, awesome. So I walk out of there, and uh, I see this Maserati. No, I'm, true story. So Maserati, top down. It's sprinkling. It just did my heart good. I was like, this is, 
this is great. <laughs> you know, I'm snapping a picture of it. Did I go back into Stella's and say, hey, with the guy with the Maserati, you might want to go outside? <laughs> nope, I did not. <laughs> if that's your car, sorry about that. But if that's your car, we should probably talk. <laughs> Got some projects we want to do. For wisdom is more profitable than silver, her wages are better than gold. Check this out. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her, with wisdom, right? So nothing, right, is better. She offers you long life in her right hand, riches and honor in her left. She will guide you down delightful paths. Now, he's not talking about education. It's important. He is talking about wisdom. There's a difference. She will guide you on down delightful paths, and her ways are satisfying. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Which, by the way, if you don't, ugh, right? Wisdom is the tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. So first of all, he, right away he, he says, My, uh, the Lord corrects or disciplines those he loves. An unloving God would let us just be our, be up, it's up to you guys. Figure it out. Let, uh, hard knock life, right? Do whatever you want. Learn the hard way. That's what an unloving God would do. It's, you know, go your own way, do your own thing, good luck. Uh, see you later. That's what an unloving God does and an unloving parent. You want chaos in your classroom? Don't discipline anybody in your classroom. You want chaos on your basketball team? Don't make anybody run lines when they mess up. You want chaos in your home? Let everybody go their own way. Discipline's super hard. A coach that doesn't bring discipline to this team has checked out on that team. A teacher who doesn't bring discipline into the classroom has checked out on their students. A parent who doesn't bring discipline to the home has basically checked out as well. Proverbs 19, 18 says, discipline your children while there is hope. <laughs> Check this out. Otherwise you will ruin their lives. What does a kid say when you're disciplining them? You're ruining my life. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. It's the complete opposite of that. When God brings discipline, he, bring, he brings it simply because he loves me. The thought that God would stop doing that to me is horrifying, right? Because that basically means he's just like, well, you're on your own. Blesses the man who finds wisdom. A life without discipline is a life of foolishness. So the goal in every, uh, when we discipline is to bring wisdom. That should be the goal. The goal is to not let off steam. It's not to feel big or powerful. It's to bring wisdom. So here's everybody's favorite verse, except for children, but everybody's favorite verse when it comes to discipline. Proverbs 13, 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Or spare the rod, spoil the child, right? Like, ah, no, third one, no. And so you don't, right? So my take on this is a little bit different. Solomon, who writes this, grew up in a palace. But his daddy, David, grew up on a farm. And his job on the farm was to be a shepherd to his daddy's sheep. So... I, how does David, my guess is that David taught Solomon all this stuff. And here's what we learn from David about the rod here. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows and leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength and guides me along right paths and bring honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and staff, what do they do? Protect and comfort. 
I, don't th I think David, if he ever came home with one of his daddy's sheep that had been beaten and bloodied because David had a bad day and took it out on the sheep, I think dad would have had a massive problem with that. Why? The sheep is valuable. They're gonna sell that sheep. I can't sell a sheep that's been broken and beaten. Right? Now the rod and staff weren't sort of beat the sheep. It was to protect the sheep. So David used the rod and staff to protect the sheep from the wolf or the lion or the, or the snake. That's what he beat, the enemy, not the sheep. Our kids are not the enemy. Yeah, sometimes. No, we're all on the same team. But a sheep is dumb. Sheeps are dumb. They wander off. They don't even know why. They're like, hey, there's a bee. Oh, hey, there's a flower. Hey, there's a cliff. They don't know. They're just wandering. And occasionally what the shepherd would do if a sheep was heading to a dangerous place was he'd hurl that rod right towards that sheep, not to hit the sheep, but just to get the sheep's attention. It was to redirect them. Like, oh, yeah, I, I didn't know. I didn't know those, that that plant was poisonous. I didn't know. That's the purpose for the rod and the staff. Occasionally a shepherd would do a checkup using the, the rod as well. He'd pull back the wool with his rod and check to see if there's bruising or, or uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, health issue with the sheep. Remove the rod from the, from the sheep and, the, and the, shep, you know, the, the sheep are basically helpless if all of a sudden the shepherd said you stupid sheep I'm tired of watching you go your own way good luck the sheep would die the sheep would die they're not strong enough they're not fast enough they're not smart enough they need the rod and staff of a good shepherd is there time for discipline yes without a chaos rules. So here are some guidelines. If you are married, get on the same page as your spouse. This should be talked about. It should be agreed upon. One of you can't be super fun. One of you can't be super strict. Parents, there's some wonderful resources. I ask our kid men staff, hey, give me some help here. What's some books that, that people can uh, purchase and read? And write this down. Uh, you can go right now on Amazon and order these. It'll be when you get home, it'll be there probably. So just go ahead and take care of this. Uh, these are great resources. Again, most of the time we just don't know what to do. So here you go. Love and Logic Parenting. They really recommended this one. It's by Foster Klein and Jim Fay. Uh, the Five Love Languages for Kids by Gary Chapman. They also recommended that extremely highly. And they want, and so get those books and read them. Another thing that I think is important is check your motives. Far too, and again, by the way, I made a lot of mistakes on this area. And oftentimes, um, when I had a bad day, I took it out on my kids. When my patience had already been shot. Never a good thing. It wasn't my kids' fault. So I had to learn to take some breaths, even count to ten if I needed to address some things, it needed to be done after that, after I decompressed, right? So do that. Now let me shift focus here. I know it's a parenting series, but I'm gonna talk to the kids that are here in the room, which is all of us, but I'm gonna talk to the kids that are here in the room. And um, um, Ephesians 6, let's take a look at this. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children. Obey your parents. Why? Because you belong, because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your mom and dad. This is the first commandment with a promise. By the way, next weekend's Mother's Day. Every kid should be in church with their mom. That's honoring your mom. By the way, moms, leverage that like crazy. <laughs> Pastor said you're going to hell if you don't come with me. You say that, quote. 
Or you can beat them. I don't care what you do. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Honor your mother and father. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor, if, right? So you might not, but if you honor your father and mother, here's what will happen. Things will go well for you. And you will have a long life on the earth. Both really good stuff. Now, Christianity has done a ton of stuff for kids. When the Apostle Paul was writing these words, children were in a perilous situation. A Roman father had absolute authority and power in his home. He could sell his kids as slaves if he wanted to. And there was hundreds of thousands of slaves in Rome at this time. He could punish them as he liked. He could inflict the death penalty if he so choose. The power of the, of the father extended to the life of the father. It wasn't after the kid moved out. Dad still had ultimate authority over his own fire, his family. When a child was born, he would be placed at the feet of his father. And if the father turned his back on the child, they would take the baby and throw it out. And anybody who wanted it could have it. Unwanted children would be left available for slavery and for all kinds of bad stuff. If a child was weak or deformed, typically what they would do was just drown it. So the first commandment here that a child would learn in a little Jewish home would be honor your mom and dad. Obedience were linked up with this. Notice it doesn't say kids, hey, love your parents. It says children obey. Obedience is a sign of love. Listen to what Jesus says. This is Jesus. If you love me, just tell me. Write me a note or something. Sing some songs. If you love me, obey my commandments. This is about a relationship that we have with Jesus. Jesus is massively clear. It's not enough to say that you and I love him. Talk is cheap. Anybody can say that. I, I love you with one breath and then totally disregard their instructions after that. For Jesus, the test of love was always obedience. Jesus didn't let love just be an emotion. You'll know all too well a family member who claimed to love his mom and dad and then totally disregards their wishes and brings pain and heartache and chaos and fear. To Jesus, real love is not an easy thing, but it, an easy thing, but it is shown in obedience. There's those of us who say we love our wives but are inconsiderate and selfish. You might say you love your mom and dad, but if you're being disobedient, you're breaking their heart and bringing confusion to their home. Second John chapter one, verse six says, love means doing what God has commanded us. So here's the definition of love. Love means doing what God has commanded. And he has commanded us, what, what did he tell us to do? To love one another. So I can be told to love. Just as you heard from the beginning, and mom and dad, you totally get this. Just think how happy your home would be if your kids would obey. That'd be awesome. Especially because you're a good mom and dad. You don't make unrealistic, you don't have unrealistic demands and ridiculous demands on your kids. And when disobedience comes, you, you show discipline. God has the same dream for those of us in the family of God. What God's dream for me is simply obedience. He knows very well that his laws, his commands are not unrealistic. They're not over, overbearing. He's not being ridiculous. It'd be horrible, right, to think that if God was just having a poor day at work, he'd take it out on me. Poof. What was that for? I don't know, you're here. I'm a little, angels are giving me fits. Bunch of people down on the earth, goofing around. Poof. Tired of all this. That'd be horrible, right? To think that if God was this abusive person who just was having a poor day, then I'll never have to worry about that with him. Kids, young people, young people, you're, you're not going to like this, but I am telling this to you because it is biblical and I'm your pastor and I care and I want the best thing for you in your home 
The godliest thing that you can do, if you are in love with Jesus, the godliest thing that you can do is to obey your mom and dad without whining. I'll just throw that in. I hate you. No snarky attitude. But they're so unreasonable. They're out of touch. They're overprotective. That might be true. Not saying it's not. I don't know. But here's what I do know about your mom and dad. They know exactly what you're going through right now. Now, it might be totally different. I know the pressures, the, the pace of life is way different than when I was a kid. Uh, but one of the things that really woke me up when I was a parent to my boys as they were going through the teen years was I was going, oh, nuts. I know exactly what they're feeling. I know exactly the heartache when a girlfriend breaks up with you. I know the exact heartache of, of, of being home on homecoming night. The insecurities, the, the, the fear uh, of, right? I, I, know the, I know the feeling of not getting on the ball team. <sighs> Please, God, let them get on the ball team, right? You totally know this stuff. So kids, your parents, they might be, they may not like your music. I hated my kids' music. I was like, rap. What, why were you listening to that? So I'm cranking on, you know, 105.9, listen to some good stuff. You know, and so today, it, it, it actually has worked. Mitch and Justin both like Journey and Boston and, you know, yes. And we're always trying to figure out some way to kind of push our parents' buttons and those kind of stuff. But, um, but I do know that your parents love you. They want the very best for you. And so when they, when they say, you know what, I, I think you're heading for a train wreck. I think, you, I think, you're, I think you're going a, a direction that's just going to bring heartache and hurt. And I'm pulling it in for a little while because ah, what I see is just a mess. They truly want the best for you. They truly, truly do. Christ followers, Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He wants the best for you as well. And he has been in our shoes. He's been tempted just like me. He knows heartache and loss and loneliness. He knows what it's like to lose his best friend, to have his friends run out on him. So he knows. And he always has my best interest in mind. And it hurts his heart when he thinks that we think we know better than what he, you know, than, than he does. And as a good shepherd, he will bring his rod and staff to the table to protect and guide me and lead me to some green pastures. Moms and dads, totally pulling for you. and You can do this. I know that you're totally in love with your kids and want the very, very best for them. I also know that this topic is super, super hard to do and to do it well. But if you will discipline out of love and you will see wisdom as the goal here, you will see amazing things take place in your own. Probably one of the best things, and again, we, I know we, we continue to, to kind of push this for you, but find your way to a small group. Ask some parents, how are you doing this? We've got some, right? It's like, I don't know. We've never been there. Uh, how did you do this? What did, what did you say? How did you, you know, and just ask for prayers. Again, I'm going to ask for prayers as well. This is for me. We have two weeks with six-year-olds. Our, our grandkids are coming this summer. Again, uh, uh, Linda said, yeah, that'd be great. I know. <laughs> no. In fact, it'd be my contention is, I always thought I should write a book called Parenting Like Grandpa and Grandma, because that's way better. <laughs> You're so much more calm, so much more like at peace. It's just so wonderful. And if you could just give them back, that would be great. So, you know, it's like, be just for a little while. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for being so patient with us. My guess is there's some folks here today that are, 
maybe even grew up in a home that was out of control, abusive. We never really knew who was coming home at night. A good dad or really bad dad. And we swore we would never ever do that to our kids. And we're still working through forgiveness issues and we're still struggling with some anger. And I pray that you will just help us calm that stuff down. Not suppress it, but just help us calm that stuff down. Maybe deal with it in some good ways. But sometimes, Lord, we just deal with stuff that's happened in our past and even when we were growing up in some massive inappropriate ways that are dangerous and, and dark. So I pray that people might be able today to muster up enough courage to forgive. I think for the most part, every parent here is trying to do their very best. Do we always get it right? Absolutely not. And I just wanna, I wanna pray for moms and dads here today. They will continue to figure out ways to love and guide, but I want them to have the peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness self-control that it will be required for this task. I know there's a bunch of kids in the room today as well. I pray that you will um, help them to understand that their mom and dad love them with all their heart and want the very best for their life. And as we work together as a home and a family, that there will be peace that permeates our lives and help us to be obedient to them and to our Heavenly Father, in whose name we pray, amen. All right, thank you so much for being here this weekend. Blessings to you. We'll see you again next Sunday, Mother's Day. Invite, invite, invite.